together. Thanks for thinking to include me in this group. This has just been an amazing conference. Um, let me take us back quickly to Thursday uh, when Jay Geed said to us that the adolescent brain is not a broken brain, something I agree with. But we've also heard this morning that there are a number of things that adolescents do that are maladaptive and that put their health and sometimes their lives in danger. So for example, they get in more serious car accidents do, than do older counterparts. They have more unprotected sex. They commit more crimes, including violent crime. And uh, adolescence is the most likely age of life for someone to begin experimenting with drugs, alcohol, and tobacco. Um, and so this is a problem that researchers have been interested in for a long time. Why is it that adolescents are more inclined to take risks? Um, and what's interesting is that most of the research doesn't support popular beliefs about adolescent risk taking. So for example, it doesn't look like adolescents take risks because they think they're invincible. It's not because they can't perceive or don't understand the nature of the risk. In fact, sometimes they overestimate the likelihood of a consequence or a harm occurring as a result of some of their actions. And it's not because they're not capable of logical reasoning. Um, most of the data suggests that by about age 15, individuals are capable of adult level reasoning that would be adequate to make reasonable decisions about risk uh, circumstances. So what we've tried to do is to focus our um, inquiries on the specific context in which adolescent risk taking is most likely to take place. Uh, and one of the very hallmarks of adolescent risk taking, as we just heard from Sarah Jane, is that it's much more likely to take place in the context of peers than is, adult, than is adult risk taking. So adolescents will take more risks when with friends, and we don't see that pattern in adults. So most of you, I'm sure, can think of something crazy or reckless you did when you were a teenager and you were hanging with your friends that you wouldn't have done when you were alone. And the evidence is, uh, is not just anecdotal. So for all of the types of risks that I described before, the statistics suggest that adolescents take these risks more often when they're with friends than when, when they were alone. Um, but of course, correlation is not causation, right? And so there's a rather uninteresting explanation for this phenomenon. Maybe we find that adolescents take more risks with friends because they do everything more often with friends. They shop more with friends, they talk more with friends, they hang out with friends all the time. So in order to demonstrate that there's a causal or direct impact of peers on adolescent decision making, uh, before I arrived at Temple University, my colleague and main collaborator on the work that I'm describing, Larry Steinberg, and his graduate student, Marco Steinberg, ran a study involving adolescents, young adults who are college-aged and adults. Um, and they played a game that I won't really give you the details of, but it's a risk-taking game that they called the chicken game. And everybody came to the lab with two friends who are the same gender and roughly the same age. And the key to the experiment was a manipulation of the social context in which the game was played. So half of them were randomly assigned to play the game alone, and the other half of them played the game while being flanked by their two friends who they brought with them that day. And the results were really compelling. So if you look at the cohorts who played the game on their own, there were no age differences in overall risk taking in the game. But if you look at those who played the game while having their friends sitting next to them, the adolescents were um, almost doubly likely to take risks in this game. There's a peer effect also present in the college kids and in the adults you see no such effects. So this is an age by social context interaction. So this tells us that it's probably not just a correlational phenomenon, that there actually is an impact of being with social others when you're making these decisions. Um, but there are a number of intuitive and reasonable explanations for what might be going on here. So for example, maybe adolescents are just more distracted by their friends, or maybe their friends are more distracting. Maybe they're trying to somehow mimic or model each other's behavior. So this is like a social transference or social conformity effect of the type that we were just listening to. Or as I suspect many of you are thinking, maybe this is just another case of peer pressure. So maybe the adolescent's friends say things that actually lure them into riskier behavior. So this is actual coercion. Or on a more implicit level, maybe they're mentalizing about what their friends might want them to do. They're trying to impress them. And they're doing so because they're interested in trying to either gain social status or avoid social rejection. And these are all quite reasonable explanations for this phenomenon. Um, I'm not going to have time to tell you about all the work that we've done trying to drill down into this. Uh, but I want to show you some, I want to highlight some of our findings that I think suggest these are probably not um, solely the explanation for what's going on in this peer phenomenon. So let me tell you what I'm talking about. As we've explored uh, vulnerability to peer influences, we found that peers do not influence adolescents' performance on attentionally demanding tasks like the go-no-go -no -go or working memory tasks, which tells us it's probably not a simple attentional distraction phenomenon. Peers do affect, in a number of instances now for us, risk-taking, reward-seeking, and reward sensitivity measures. And this happens even in contexts where you really constrain their opportunity for verbal interaction. 
So it's probably not a matter of explicit social pressures being put on them. And even when there's no one else modeling the behavior, so it's not a, a social transference or, or social conformity effect. Um, we also find the same phenomenon in tasks that don't really provide an opportunity to show off, like a temporal discounting task. So it's hard to interpret this as some kind of like attempt to impress by my act of bravado because I'm willing to take a little less money right now instead of waiting longer for some uh, larger amount later. Um, and more recently, we've been exploring uh, the use of a virtual peer paradigm where there's not an actual person in another room, but you think there is, you don't know them, you're not going to be interacting with them in the future, and yet we still find that there's a strong peer influence. So when adolescents play the game, they think someone in another room is watching them who is identified as a peer. Um, they will still show this, this increase in risk taking or greater sensitivity to immediate reward. It's of a similar magnitude to when they have real friends there. And since they're not going to be interacting with this person later, it's hard to interpret this as some kind of attempt to uh, affect your social status or your standing among the group. So in general, these findings have suggested to us that a number of intuitive accounts probably don't explain the phenomenon, and they've led us to uh, further investigate an, uh, an idea that this is really having something to do with the way that the adolescent brain is wired or comes to be wired during adolescence. So the premise that we've been working on is that social contexts actually change the way in which information is processed during decision making about risk. And so to explore that hypothesis, we've been conducting a series of fMRI studies. I'm going to tell you today about two of them. Um, and so the first one was a study that we conducted in 42 individuals. We, set, we recruited them from three groups. So again, we had adolescents, young adults, and adults. And we had them play a game that we call the stoplight game. So here's the stoplight game. It's a very simple driving simulation. There's no steering at all. You're just on a straight track. And you're going to encounter a series of intersections. But this is like the worst time stretch of road you've ever been on because every intersection you get to, it's turning yellow. It's about to turn. And you're faced with a decision. You have one control in this. You either press a button or you don't. If you press a button, the car comes to a screeching halt. If you don't press the button, you're going to be taking a chance and running through the light. And there are three plausible outcomes. So if you hit the brakes, you know what's going to happen. You're going to be stuck there at the light for a short period of time. And sometimes you can see you made a bad decision because no car comes to the intersection. You would have made it. So there, you're not always motivated to hit the brakes. Okay? You might also take a chance, in which case you could successfully run through this intersection, saving time, which gets you to destination sooner, in which case you're going to get more monetary reward at the end. Um, or you might make a mistake here. You take a chance, you run through the light, but you crash for this car that you couldn't see coming in from the perpendicular roadway, and you're stuck there for a long time while the car magically repairs itself, gets back on the roadway, and lets you continue. Okay, so this was a study that we conducted in the scanner, as I told you, um, and uh, you know, we're dealing with a 60 centimeter bore in this particular scanner, and as much as we wanted to try to find a way to kind of stuff the friends in there next to them, we could really do that, and so we were forced to think about a different way to do the peer manipulation, which actually turned out to be, I think, very serendipitous. Um, so rather than have the friends in there in the scanner room with them, we had the friends sitting in the control area outside. And you know, the scanner's making all kinds of noise, and we didn't want to have all these uh, you know, auditory interactions the whole time like they might have when they were sitting in a room together. So we actually had to constrain when they could interact and the way in which they interacted. So we did allow them to talk. They spoke only at the beginning of each round. And they were specifically told not to say anything that might be a lure, might suggest the kind of behavior they wanted their friend to, put, to engage in. All they were allowed to say is, hey, I'm out here. I'm watching you. I can see in real time what you're doing on the screen here. And I've made some general predictions about how I think this task is going to go. That's it. That's all they heard. And they heard, 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 heard only uh, every eight minutes or so, just to remind them that their friends were out there. Okay, and in this case, we had this was a within subject manipulation. So for the other half of the time, they were told that there was no audience. So either they had no idea the friends were going to be there in the first place, they played the game alone, and then we introduced the friends, or we told them, okay, you know what, your friends are going to go do some other stuff now. You're on your own, and by the way, we're going to turn off the screen out here. Nobody's watching, have at it. Okay, so, and, and we asked afterward, they, they did believe that manipulation. So this is a within subjects manipulation with a highly constrained interaction. Um, the behavioral results are very similar to what we saw in the Gardner and Steinberg study. So if you look at the three age groups, behaviorally they take a similar and non-significantly different number of risks in the task. But when you look at what happens when you introduce the peer context, adolescents in this case were significantly more likely to engage in risk taking. And for, for this particular sample, there was no effect in the college or older adult group. 
Now we turn to the brain. So we thought that we might see some general age-dependent differences, sort of like the ones that we've heard described by Bea and Chuck and Adrian earlier today. Uh, so we looked for a main effective age, and consistent with the idea that there's maturation of the brain's control circuitry, we did see differences across the age groups um, in regions that are consistent with cognitive control or executive function, stronger engagement of these regions for the older groups relative to the younger groups. But importantly, none of these regions showed any sensitivity at all to social context. They were engaged more for adults than adolescents, regardless of whether the game was played in front of peers or played alone. What we were looking for were brain regions that showed a pattern consistent with the behavior, the age by social context interaction. And when we looked for regions that had that pattern, it was a very selective finding. There were just two little clusters in the brain that showed that pattern, the ventral striatum and the orbitofrontal cortex, both regions that we've already been discussing as known part, parts of the brain's reward circuitry. And the pattern that we saw there was consistent with the behavior. It was increased activation in the ventral striatum when the peers were watching the teenagers, no effect at all on adults' ventral striatal output. A second question we asked is, could we use activity in any of the brain regions that showed age or social context dependent effects to predict the decision that the individual would go on to make? So we looked at the moments of activity leading up to the decision, and we sorted the data into trials in which they made a risky decision, compared them to trials in which they made a, a safe or not risky decision. And the only regions where we found a predictive effect were, again, in these reward-related regions, and it was specifically in the teenagers. So for the teen group, they showed increased ventral striatal output when they were about to take a risk, and they showed weaker ventral striatal output when they were not going to take a risk. We also thought, is this relevant in any way to real-world risk-taking? So I can tell you generally that the stoplight task is correlated with sensation-seeking, the performance on the stoplight task, but when we looked at the neural peer effect, that is the difference in activation in the peer relative to the alone condition. We correlated that against a number of self-report measures, and we found a strong and significant correlation to self-reported resistance to peer influence, which asked people to describe whether there's someone who generally acts alone, kind of as an individual, or goes along with the crowd. And for those people who said they tend to go along with the crowd, they showed a larger peer effect, neural peer effect, in the activation of the ventral striatum. The same pattern was also there in the OFC, but a little bit weaker. Okay, and this is across the whole sample. All right, so this evidence suggested to us that the effect of peers might really be on the way in which reward information is being processed. And so that led us to a subsequent question. Could we see a similar pattern of impact of peers if you take away the opportunity for risk-taking and you just offer rewards? So that is in a simple reward processing task. And here, um, this is work that was direct, uh, being, being conducted and led by Ashley Smith, the same Ashley Smith who got the gold star from Jim Bjork earlier. Okay, so uh, to do this, we used a variant of the Delgado card guessing task that you heard about before, so it's a high-low task. Um, and in our version of it, individuals saw a cue. It either offered an opportunity for a large reward if you got the trial right, a small reward, or no reward. And I'll just mention while I have this up there that we didn't see a reward magnitude dependent effect, so we collapsed the large and small, and we compared rewarded to non-rewarded trials. Okay, then after seeing the cue, they saw the back of a card and they're asked to make a guess. Is the other side of this card going to have a number on it that's higher or lower than the digit five? And then after a uh, short jittered interval, they saw the result and they saw uh, whether or not they were rewarded for the trial. So uh, this, just like in the stoplight paradigm, was a within subjects manipulation. Halfway through the paradigm, they crossed over. So if they were peer first, then they went alone, alone into peer. And for the analysis I'm going to show you, we've, we've analyzed it a number of different ways. This is a simple ROI-based analysis. We took anatomically defined nucleus accumbens, proximal to where we saw differences in the stoplight paradigm. We also looked at a control region where we didn't think we'd see a phenomenon like this in the lateral prefrontal cortex, close to where we saw those age-dependent effects. And we took the coefficient from the difference between rewarded and non-rewarded trials, uh, put that into a second-level uh, ANOVA, looking at age by social context interactions in the Q period and then in the subsequent receipt period. We saw nothing at all in the Q period, no age effects, no social context effects during that Q anticipation period. But when we looked at the receipt period and we compared again rewarded to non-rewarded trials, we saw a very familiar pattern. So for individuals, the, the teens who were playing, the, or who were playing this uh, guessing game with their friends watching, we saw increased nucleus accumbens outputs and we don't see any difference at all in the social context for the adults. And this was true bilaterally and not present in the lateral prefrontal cortex. So it was a selective effect for the accumbens. So, uh, so far, what the data suggested to us is that our intuitive accounts, many of those ideas we might have about why peers influence adolescents, don't really uh, pan out that well in the experimental evidence. 
and that in, there is some support for a biological account. And it looks like what might be happening is that adolescents are priming a reward sensitive or approach motivational state. Um, but whenever I've presented this work, somebody in the audience always has this idea, well, you know, it's probably just that they're very worried in some way about what the observer is thinking of them. It's some kind of implicit peer pressure. It's mentalizing of the type that um, Sarah Jane was talking about. Um, and, and I can't rule that out as a possibility. It, it certainly seemed like that might be going on. So I want to tell you about one further experiment that we conducted. This is an experiment involving um, drinking in social settings. We recruited 24 adolescent, 24, 24 adult individuals. We gave them unlimited access to alcohol. And we had a peer manipulation. And yes, I did just say that we gave adolescents unlimited access to alcohol. Um, but the reason that we could do that is these were not human adolescents. <laughs> I've learned to pause there. I used to talk over that. Okay, these are mice. And one of the, there's lots of advantages to moving into a mouse model. Um, you've, we, we've been talking about mechanisms the whole conference. But one of the advantages is that most of us don't think that mice engage in the kind of mentalizing behaviors that we were worried might be um, confounding the phenomenon. I doubt that Mickey over here is worried about what Fluffy and Squeaky are thinking about whether he drinks or not, right? So uh, let me tell you about how we actually did the study. So this was done in C57 black mice. They were uh, raised together in triads. So we took three of them after weaning, put them into their cages. We tested half of them as adolescents. The other half was postnatal day 28 to 30 in this species. Tested the other half of them as adults, roughly uh, postnatal day 85. Then half of them were tested in the testing apparatus alone. The other half in a social context with the peers with whom they were raised. Okay, so here's what happened. We brought them to this novel testing environment. These are mice that like ethanol. They will self-administer. They've never experienced ethanol before. They now have free access to a 5% ethanol solution. And there are four sipper tubes, so there's no competition at all for access. There's not like I'm kind of hoarding or somebody's waiting behind me. They can just kind of roam around the cage, and whenever they want the drink, they can go get it. And we uh, videotaped them for 45 minutes. And we coded the videotapes for three behaviors. So we looked at overall locomotor activity, movements between the two chambers, and sort of crossing through the middle. We looked at the number of times they went up to visit the sippers, and we looked at the duration of drinking. How long did they spend drinking once they got up there? There are no differences across age or social context in locomotor activity, so they're moving around just as much whether they're in the social context or not, they actually visit the sippers just as often. So they actually go up and taste the drink just as frequently when they're in a social context as when they're in a low condition. But when you look at the duration of drinking, we see a pattern that we've seen before. So the adolescents and the adults, no different when they're in the alone condition. So they're put in the cage by themselves. They drink about the same amount. But when you look at what happens when you put them in the social context, you see a significant increase in the drinking for the adolescents, but not for the adults. So here I'm showing you the human data next to the mouse data, strikingly similar. I don't know if they reflect this shared biological mechanism or not, but I think the comparison is compelling. In both cases, we have evidence for an age by social context interaction. I don't think that our human data or our mouse data are easily explained with regard to some kind of implicit social cognition or mentalizing phenomenon. And in both cases, I think we find support for a biological account for this. So just to kind of sum up a little bit, I've told you that social context is important to adolescents. I don't think that the peer effect on adolescent behavior has to do with attention distraction. I don't think it has to do with explicit peer pressures. Not that those things aren't possible, but they don't explain the phenomenon that we see, at least in the lab. Um, and instead, we think that this suggests that the impact of peers is on reward circuitry. It primes an approach motivational state that causes adolescents, when they're with their friends, to want to engage in approach and consumatory behaviors. And let me just quickly tell you about our current directions, because I think I have time. I'm out of time. Give me like 30 seconds. Here we go. Ready? Just put them up. Just tell you what we're doing right now and tell you if you're interested. We're looking at all kinds of interesting things and a couple of my graduate students are in the room who could tell you about the interventions that we're trying right now and looking at some of the specificity of the phenomenon. Thank you.